Good morning. I've been told I can start. That's good. I, I always hated going by Bell, bring back uh, flashbacks of school on matters, you know, ringing the bell to go to another class. Before we start, we're going to have Brother Caleb, Caleb lead us in prayer. And if you would, Caleb. Please bow with me as we go to our God in prayer. Dear God, we are so thankful for everything that you've given us, but today we are very thankful for the ability to gather here uh, to worship you. As we go through this period of Bible study, please, God, be with us uh, with our hearts and our minds, that they will be attuned to your word, that they will, it will impact us in our individual ways that we, that we need it most. Please be with Tim, our brother Tim, as, it, as he goes through uh, Hebrews with us today. Let him uh, have a, a ready recollection of uh, the word. It's through your son, uh, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Caleb. For those who do not know me, and most of you do, my name's Tim Fisher. We will be studying Hebrews for the next 13 weeks and probably won't finish it. I am grateful to the eldership on giving me this opportunity to teach again, and uh, my gratitude goes out to them. Hebrews, uh, is it a book that everybody opens up in the New Testament, and I really want to study that one first off? <laughs> Not really. Um, but we're going to simplify it, and it is, an, it is a really a very eloquent book, and and if I had to summarize it in one sentence, and I put it here, the supremacy of Christ over Judaism. If you can remember that, that is the basis of the entire book of Hebrews. Whenever you study any book, Matthew through Revelation, uh, and you really are intensively studying the book, and we are going to do so, uh, you need to ask yourself these questions before you start. What did it mean to the audience it was written to? That is definitely important. What's the context and the historical background that the audience has? What's the message that the author is trying to convey to the audience? And what applications are there for us today? And what's the relevance of the message today and how can it be used in my personal life? That perhaps is one big application that we need to take from any book of the uh, Old or New Testament that we do study. And we're going to try to answer all of these questions throughout our study of Hebrews. Now I want to take a moment to discuss what Bible translations that I will be using. When you intensively study any book, it's probably a good idea to use multiple uh, Bible translations. And I want to make you aware of the documentation throughout our study. And I want, you, I want you to make note of the abbreviations that we will be using. One translation I will be using is the New King James Version was published in 1981. It's the NKJV, so when you see that abbreviation, that is what that stands for. It's the fifth revision of the King James Bible, which most of you are familiar with, that came out in 1611. The ESV, the English Standard Version. I have grown to like this translation immensely. Um, and perhaps becoming my favorite translation. The ESV was published in 2001, and it was a revision of the RSV, which was the Revised Standard Version, which was a revision of the ASV. Do understand that all of these revisions stem from revising the King James Version, okay? The ASV is a very word-for-word -word, uh, translation, which I'll discuss in a moment. I'll also be using the NASB, the 
New American Standard Bible, published in 1971. This was a revision of the ASV to make it more readable. I'll also be using the NIV, the New Inter International Version, 1978. It's not my purpose to endorse or belittle any translation. Each translation has its merits and its criticisms. We will use whatever translation that provides the best interpretation of the passages in Hebrews. And comparison of translations is frequently helpful. It would be wise uh, to have a Greek dictionary such as Mounts or Strong's, especially when studying Hebrews. For those who have smartphones, and I suspect many of you do, uh, if you have the Accordance app, you can get the ESV translation, and when you push on it, come up with Mounts' Greek Dictionary. All right, that's extremely helpful. Here is a chart um, showing Bible translation comparison, which I thought was helpful. And if you notice on the left side, the word for word, the interlinear, which is Greek interlinear, interlinear word for word translation. Then you had the NASB, the New American Standard Bible Amplified. ESV, King James Version, New King James Version. Those are more word-for-word -word translations. Um, the NIV, which I will be using, as we see, is more of a thought-for-thought -thought type of translation. The most common selling Bible during the last year, I think 40% of Bible sales, is the NIV. And I have to understand that people do use it. All right? And... Um, the reading level of the NIV is about a 7th, 8th grade reading level. Makes it very easy to read. King James Version is about a 12th grade reading level. What's easier to read? All right. ESV and the New King James Version, 10th uh, grade reading level. Um, NASB, since it's more of a word for word translation, about 11th grade reading level. But when it's all said and done, the, the most important reason for choosing a Bible is the one that helps you understand what is being said, all right? And as a rule, accuracy of the translation increases when it's a word-for-word -word translation. That's not 100%. And readability decreases. If you feel that that's best done with a word-for-word -word translation, then the NASB, the King James, New King James Version, or the ESV would be the translation that I would recommend that you go with. If it is a thought for a thought version like the NIV, then go with that one. However, when it's all said and done, if you don't have a Bible that you read, it doesn't do you any good whatsoever. So what is most important is reading one. Why study Hebrews? That is a real good question to start with. How many of you have been discouraged as a Christian or discouraged in your life in general? Everybody. If, if, you have not, if you're a person that's never been discouraged, I need to talk to you, okay, and learn your secret. Um, sometimes we need a brother or sister in Christ to exhort us. Hebrews was written to exhort Christians who were struggling to keep their faith and remain true to Jesus. That is the reason the book was written. And it's as applicable today as it was in antiquity. It's important for you and I to hold on to our faith, our Christian faith. So that is an important reason for us to study Hebrews. Whenever Hebrews is mentioned, people, you know, most Christians tend to think of Melchizedek and the blood of bulls and goats. And they find that Hebrews is extremely difficult to study and to understand. They, risk, they miss the real meaning of the book. And what the Holy Spirit was trying to get across in the first century and also in the 21st century. It can be a difficult book to understand unless you become familiar with the language of the book. 
The Old Testament is frequently referenced in Hebrews. Every chapter in Hebrews will have quotations from the Old Testament or allusions to the Old Testament. Terminology will be given by the author involving the Levitical priesthood, what their functions are, sacrificial functions especially. These will be frequently encountered. There is the language of syncresis in Hebrews, which is comparison and contrast. If you look at chapter 1, it's the contrast of Jesus to prophets and angels. Chapter 2, um, it is, um, I have a blank mind. Chapter 3 is Moses, and ch chapter 1, angels, and then you have Aaron in chapter 5, Joshua in chapter 4, and there will be this increase, this comparison and contrast uh, that will undergo. Figurative language will be used. There are many passages in Hebrews that are not to be taken literally. For instance, uh, you have heard the phrase, uh, the word of God cuts like a two-edged sword, all right? Well, obviously, the word of God is not cutting you, okay? It's what that, that little, it's not literal. It's figurative language that's being used. We will encounter these and also uh, discuss them. <clears throat> it's true that the author is going to discuss Melchizedek, Chapter 7 is going to discuss the sacrificial system and the priesthood of the Levites. Chapters 7 through 9, 10, first part of 10, and other examples in the New Testament. But he's going to argue that none of these external examples constituted pure religion to God. What is going to be emphasized by the author is that our purified conscience through a superior covenant, that is the new covenant, which is mediated by our high priest, Jesus, and he will be interceding for us forever. That is a huge emphasis in Hebrews, that the Old Testament did not provide cleansing of the conscience. We have the Old Testament the old covenant being done away with and we have a new high priest that mediates for us like the Old Testament high priest mediated for the people on the day of atonement. And the difference between the Old Testament high priest and Jesus is that the Old Testament high priest died, correct? There were many of them. Jesus Christ is forever and we will see how he comes to be our mediator by his sacrifice, which is going to be a huge emphasis in Hebrews also. Now, how can you classify the book of Hebrews? How would, I mean, we, you know, the Gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we call them Gospels. We call, you know, um, the synoptic gospels like Matthew, Mark, and Luke, okay, uh, which are very similar. We've got the writings of Paul, which we classify by itself as epistles. But, you know, the Greek word epistle um, simply means in our English language letter, okay? So when you are reading in your Bible the epistle of Paul, to the Ephesians, that is the letter of Paul to the Ephesians is what that means. The word epistle is just, a, the English word, it's just a transliteration of the Greek word epistole, okay? And a transliteration means to change letters from one language into the corresponding letters of another language. Examples that we use, uh, angelos, we transliterate that from Greek to an English word, angels. 
baptismal, uh, baptizo, um, however you want to pronounce it, means we've changed that to baptism. I'm going to be honest, it would have been a lot simpler if this word would have never been transliterated. The word baptism means to immerse, and it would have been much easier to lessen confusion in the world of Christianity if baptism or baptizo would have just been translated immersion, okay? Um, it has been quite perverted nowadays. Uh, instead of the word immersion, that it means that there is sprinkling, pouring, okay? That's not the word of, meaning of the word baptizo. Evangelio is another word we use. What's the word we get from evangelio? Evangelism, all right? So a lot of Greek words are transliterated into English words when they're translated. If you have a King James Version of your Bible <clears throat> that you use, you'll have a superinscription that says, the epistle of Paul, the apostle to the Hebrews. Now, this superinscription is not original to the book, and it was added later. Um, Hebrews, or to the Hebrews, is a traditional editorial label. If you write something, anybody, let's just say you write a short story, you got to put a title to it, right? Um, the books of the New Testament, they weren't given titles, okay? Matthew wrote his gospel, but it became known as Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, all right? Somebody else labeled it, okay? Um, that is the same thing with Hebrews. Um, the earliest Greek manuscripts from the late second century have two Hebrews. Um, we shouldn't be greatly influenced by the label. Uh, you gotta call it something, right? Um, you know, if I didn't have a label and I wanted to open up to the book of Hebrews and it wasn't labeled Hebrews in my book, in my Bible, you know, I'd have a hard time finding it perhaps, correct? And here's a picture of a King James Version. As you can see, this is an old version. Uh, the Epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Hebrews. And as you can see, this is the very early Old English. The book of Hebrews never identifies itself as an epistle. And this is reflected in the later translations of the Bible. And the reason that we're hesitant to call Hebrews an epistle or a letter is that the epistle in the Greco-Roman world followed a very specific form. It had specific expectations. At the beginning of the letter, the author was identified. Paul, as we see in his epistles that we know that were written by Paul, he identifies himself as the author. Um, the people being addressed are identified. You know, Paul, if he's writing to the church at Thessalonia, he identifies where he's writing to. At the end of the letter, there are usually salutations, that is, greetings to the people that are living there, whether he's writing to Ephesians or Thessalonians, and sometimes the copyist name is also written down. You don't find this in Hebrews, that the author is identified, you don't find who it's being written to, and there are no salutations of people being identified at the end of Hebrews. So in that instance, it's very difficult to classify Hebrews as an epistle or a letter. Most people living in antiquity could not read or write. It's been estimated that on the low end, perhaps 5% of people could read in antiquity and write, and on the high end, perhaps 20%. I'll say more 5 to 10%. It's been suggested that Jews in antiquity were more literate than the 
Gentile population since the Torah was read aloud in the synagogues. Hebrews is unlike any other book in the Bible. It's also been suggested that possibly the beginning of Hebrews has been lost. There's no historical evidence to support this assumption. Why the speculation why it's that the beginning may have been lost is because Hebrew starts off dramatically. Um, there are no salutations. Nobody's being identified where, who's writing it, where it's going to. It's just unusual how the document starts. Others have argued that the reason there are no salutations or greetings in the opening address is that it's on purpose. The focus of the book is on Jesus Christ. So maybe the author wants to grab your attention quickly. And what is the focus, the Son of God? H.E. Dana, a Baptist scholar, he phrases the dilemma of Hebrews quite well. And he states that Hebrews begins like a treatise, which means uh, an intensive study on a certain subject, proceeds like a sermon, and closes like an epistle. And he's exactly right. If we had to classify Hebrews according to a certain genre, it's always best to classify the book according to how it describes itself. Um, what did the author think he was doing? If you look at Hebrews 13, 22, the writing refers to itself as a word of exhortation. There are 305 verses in Hebrews. You can count them all. I'm correct. All right, that's how many there are. And seven, 172 verses are thought to be verses of exhortation. Now, let's define the word exhortation a little bit. Most of us, when we hear this word, we think of the idea of encouragement. I mean, is not one of the reasons going to church is for brethren to exhort us? Um, however, exhortation isn't always good, all right? Um, it certainly can carry the idea of encouragement, but exhortation also can convey a warning or admonition. Uh, speaking in a way expressing disapproval, criticism, or urging somebody to do something, all right? So how many times have you heard a preacher standing in this pulpit expressing disapproval on something, criticism of something that he's teaching about, or urging someone to do something, eldership urging someone to do something? Um, there are negative exhortations all the time, and they're not bad. Sometimes they're very good for us. Hebrews is filled with rhetoric. Rhetoric is the language designed to have a persuasive or impressive effect upon the audience. I'm going to be speaking with rhetoric. I hope to have a persuasive or impressive effect upon the audience that I am speaking to. The Hebrews author, he's had some special teaching as a youth taking classes on rhetoric. <clears throat> now there are a lot of exhortations. I mentioned that 172 verses are thought to be verses of exhortations. However, we could divide them up, uh, group them. We have exhortations against apostasy, chapter 2, 1 through 4. We have exhortations against disbelief in God's word, 3, 4 through 16. We have exhortations against an inactive faith. And, you know, all of those would be negative exhortations, correct? And the exhortation to draw near to God in the last three chapters. Now the author is going to re 
repeatedly used the phrase, let us. You'll see it in chapter 4, several times, chapter 6, chapter 10, and chapter 12. Um, when I say let us, and the author says let us, he's including himself in the letter of exhortation. So when he says let us do something, or let us not do something, he's including himself, okay, in this writing. There are a lot of key words that we find in Hebrews. I could have picked several. However, um, my main key word that I want you to remember for Hebrews is the word hold. It certainly is not the most frequently used key word, but I think it grabs and catches the idea of the book that these Hebrews were to hold on to their faith, not revert from Christianity back to Judaism. So we're going to, I don't run the book. I said we're going to discuss it later as we study. Um, so hold to what? Hold to their faith. Better, that many people teaching Hebrews will consider this the key word. Jesus is better than the old covenant. Jesus is better than the priesthood, the high priesthood. And this word will be used 13 times. And there are other key words that we will see as we proceed through our study. Everything that was written in the ancient world was meant to be read aloud. Silent reading was uncommon until about the fourth century. It's not documented until then. So anybody writing in antiquity would be concerned about how it would sound when it was read aloud. And when you study this book, you need to read it aloud. I think that that will help you gather how this sounds to somebody, okay? Um, we said that the author is speaking with rhetoric. He wants to have a persuasive effect upon the audience. Um, if we are giving a speech or a sermon today, you know, you, you write it down first, right? Um, and uh, then you think about what you wrote down, and then you, you usually read it out loud, don't you? When you have a sermon or some type of talk, you want to know how it sounds when you speak. I don't know if this is being videoed or not, but I'm probably going to go back and look at the video and like, boy, that did not sound good <laughs> when I spoke that phrase or word. So I want to know how it sounds when I write it down and how I speak it. And when you study Hebrews, I think it's important to study it that way. Now the question is, who wrote Hebrews? The author of Hebrews, the book, does not name the author. And you find with Paul that he usually does name himself, right? And there's been a lot of possibilities mentioned through the years that have been suggested. But I'm going to tell you, it comes down to this. There's been a lot of names that have been thrown out there as the author of Hebrews, but it's either this, either Paul wrote Hebrews, or we don't know who wrote Hebrews. That's it, all right? And that's simply put. Um, if you look at the writings of the church fathers, and when I say church fathers, I mean ancient and influential Christian theologians who wrote in Greek, Paul, he was the author. It was uncontested that he was the author. However, in modern times, uh, many other possibilities have been mentioned as the writer of Hebrews. However, if you look from antiquity until probably the last 200 years, Paul was usually considered the author of Hebrews. There's been many other people that have been offered as suggestive author, authors of Hebrews, such as Paulus, Barnabas, Peter, Jude, Clement of Rome, 
Luke, Aquila, and there's been many others. So let's talk about, did Paul write Hebrews? Let's think about that. As we mentioned from the writings of the church fathers, this is the primary suggestion from antiquity. If you look at early manuscript evidence, especially the P46 document, and when I say circa 200, that means <clears throat> earliest 175, latest 225, circa means median. Okay, so a, a median time probably written around 200. And, and P in lowercase refers to papyri. Okay, so the P46 document is a collection of Paul's letters. They're scattered throughout the world at the moment some of them are in the museum at Michigan. Um, it places Hebrews in the P46 document after the book of Romans, all right? So uh, it is a collection of Paul's writings. In the New Testament that you have, more than likely, uh, and that I have, most modern English translations, I mean, since the King James Version, uh, Hebrews is positioned after Philemon. Um, and this probably goes back to Eusebius, who was a church father in the fourth century. He did not know who wrote Hebrews. So he put it at the end of Paul's letters and before what we call the Catholic epistles. Uh, the Catholic epistles are James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Jude. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not referring to the religious organization of Catholics, okay? The word Catholic just means general or universal. And the meaning, when I say Catholic epistles, is that these books were accepted by the church universally. That's the meaning of the term Catholic epistles. So these general epistles were the last New Testament books that were recognized as what, what we consider canonical, okay, that Christians uh, regard as divinely inspired by the Eastern and Western churches, okay, in 367 A.D. This great schism split in the 11th century had not occurred yet. So Asubius is playing the political aspect, putting Hebrews at the end of the Pauline letters after Philemon, and at the beginning of the Catholic epistles before James. So that way, if you think that Paul wrote Hebrews, you could put it at the end of the Pauline writings. If you think that it's a Catholic epistle that wasn't a written by Paul. You could put it at the beginning of the Catholic epistles. You know, Asubius would have made a good politician. We still think that way, you know. Um, that's exactly why Hebrews is placed after Philemon and before James in your New Testament translation. But with the P46 manuscript, as I mentioned, dated approximately 200 A.D., um, it's positioned after Romans as one of Paul's writings. And here's a picture of a fragment of the P46 manuscript in Greek. Now, the Eastern Church trans, tra tradition, I'll get it out in a moment, now, that is the Greek-speaking churches, the Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, um, they support and state that the church's opinion is that Paul wrote Hebrews. That is their position. And their argument could have been in part based on this P46 manuscript or maybe another manuscript like the P46 manuscript. They could have based their opinion on a correct manuscript or maybe this manuscript is inaccurate. The Hebrews author he's very impersonal about revealing information about himself. He doesn't mention his name, where he's writing from, who he's writing to, um, but he was acquainted with Timothy, as we see in Hebrews 13, 23. 
And that's pretty easy when you say Timothy in the New Testament. How many Timothys were there mentioned in the New Testament? One. So there's no confusion when you talk about Timothy. Um, and apparently the audience knows who Timothy is also. So Timothy is a very well-known individual. You can find certain Pauline ideas in Hebrews. There's an emphasis on faith, Christians as the real children of Abraham. The problem with Pauline ideas is that they're also found in other books not written by Paul. Paul wrote a lot of the New Testament, but there are other authors. There's no such thing as a Petrine or Joannine Christianity, which is Peter and John. There's only one Christianity that we read about in the New Testament. And you either believe in that idea or the Restoration Movement is totally obsolete and invalid. There's one Christianity. <clears throat> now, the flip side of the argument is Paul did not write Hebrews. What evidence can we give to support that? Which, as we mentioned, has only been thrown out there during the last, really, 200 years. Um, if you look at most modern Bible scholars, they do not think that Paul wrote Hebrews. So what reasons can we consider that they can offer that Paul may not have been the author of Hebrews? If you read verse 2-3 from Hebrews, it seems that the author, it, he's placing himself and distancing himself himself and the audience from the authoritative level, which is the apostolic teaching. If you look at verse 2-3, which says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed by those who heard him? All right, let's look at that verse a little carefully. <clears throat> those who heard him. Not we, not us, those. So he is dissing himself from those people that heard Jesus or saw Jesus. So the indication from this is that these Hebrews are second generation Christians. First generation Christians would be the ones that heard and listened and seen Jesus in person. Second generation would be people who were taught by that first group, people that had heard or seen Jesus. So it reveals a couple things to you. Um, these are people that preach to us, so the author did not establish this Christian community or congregation. More than likely, Hebrews is more than likely a church congregation that's in a home, all right? Most early congregations were. And the congregation was established by other people, not the author. So, because the author states both of us refer, received confirmation by those that heard it. So the author, uh, Author seems to distance himself from those people that were ear and eyewitnesses of Jesus. You don't find that in Paul. When you read Paul's known writings, he defends himself to be an authoritative apostle, apostle of Jesus, does he not? Um, he says, I am not the least of the apostles. Okay. Um, so how could you argue that Paul according to verse 2-3, uh, is, you know, that Paul did write it. it. It's possible if you consider 2-3 to be what's called a, a literary trope, which is a figure of speech. Um, <clears throat> literary tropes are, are frequently used in Greco-Roman writing to, for the author to refer to himself in the editorial we, okay, um, even when the we doesn't refer to the author. So uh, that's possible, but unlikely. <clears throat> you would expect 
that Paul would have heard preachings of other apostles as well. Um, I'm sure that occurred. Remember that Paul and Barnabas, they went to Jerusalem, okay? Um, so if Paul wrote Hebrews, maybe he's connected himself with the audience to make, make them feel that they could share in this as much as he does. However, after you read Hebrews and you read Paul's known writings, it's got to be admitted that Paul doesn't write uh, or speak like this anywhere else in his writings if you believe that he wrote Hebrews, all right? Um, and to me, this is really problematic. If you look at the position of the Western church, which is the Latin-speaking churches, uh, the leadership doubted the Pauline authorship, and that's mostly from the backing from Eusebius. And there's not really much documentation as to why. If you look at the vocabulary differences in Hebrews and the Pauline epistles, there are 154 words that are known as hapax legomenoi, all right? That's a Greek phrase. They're only used one time in the New Testament. That's a lot of words, 154 new words, all right? And, <clears throat> you know, you could, when you read Hebrews and you read Paul's writings, you could you know, you've heard the phrase, that doesn't, Paul didn't write Hebrews because it doesn't sound like Paul, okay? You have these one-time used words, these apax legomenoi. <coughs> Excuse me. However, if you look at Greek literature that is recorded, these words are found all throughout Greco-Roman language. Um, and a valid argument could be used that every new author, New Testament author had a larger vocabulary than what they use writing. How many of you use every word you know when you're speaking? <laughs> None of us do, right? I mean, we all have a larger vocabulary than what we use, okay? That's just a given. However, if you look at, you know, aside from that, there are 154 words in the book of Hebrews that occur nowhere else. That's a little bit unusual. <clears throat> you know, usually you can read something that Paul wrote, and you think to yourself, that sounds like Paul, you know? Um, Paul, if you think back on it, he thinks and writes like a Jewish rabbi. He's interesting in that sometimes he's writing he just sort of drops it, and then he comes back to it. A classic example of that is Romans 5, 1 through 11, where he's talking about suffering, and then he just drops the subject, and he comes back to it in 8, 18. Um, Paul seems to be um, not real organized, according to a lot of people, you know, to modern standards. But that's just how Jewish rabbis wrote. They sort of wrote in circles sometimes. Um, Hebrews really, to me, just seems to be too organized to be written by Paul. We had cited common thematic ideas between Paul and the Pauline writings that we know of in Hebrews. However, we can also cite a lot of thematic differences between Hebrews and the other Pauline epistles. There is no other New Testament writer that talks about Melchizedek. The Hebrews writer is going to bring up the prophecy of the new covenant in Jeremiah 31. Paul doesn't do that. He doesn't mention it at all. So perhaps uh, the best evidence that Paul didn't write Hebrews comes from Paul himself. 2 Thessalonians 3.17, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness. In every letter of mine, it is the way I write. Um, that in Hebrews that way. However, you've got to take into consideration 
that when people are writing or speaking to audiences with varying backgrounds of education and, and different historical backgrounds, and that they may write or speak differently. Paul, we mentioned that perhaps literacy was as low as 5% in antiquity. And Paul may have very well simplified his language when he's writing to these Gentile churches um, that were mostly illiterate. If I was writing to an illiterate person, would I use simpler words? Yes, I would, that they could understand. When you're writing to an educated office audience, uh, maybe you're going to use a different style. Maybe your grammar is going to be more complicated. Inspiration by the Holy Spirit does not override the personality of the author. For instance, when Paul expressed his love and concern for Israel, the, the people of Israel, it was his own, okay? Um, this means that the people reading Paul's letters could see Paul in them, okay? A personal touch. So, question is, do you think that Paul wrote Hebrews, possibly? If he did, it's not like anything else that he ever wrote. I want to show you an example of Greek style of writing in the New Testament for um, just as an example. <clears throat> Simple Greek, you will look to Mark and John's writings. That's considered simple Greek writing. Intermediate Greek, that's the writings that we know of of Paul. And advanced Greek examples would be Hebrews and Luke's writings. Luke wrote in very advanced Hebrew also. And that's why, you know, Luke or the Lucan authorship has been suggested of Hebrews also. So if Paul didn't write Hebrews, you know, who did? Um, it's been suggested that Clement of Alexandria, uh, that he suggests that Paul wrote it to the Jews and... Uh, he wrote it in Hebrew, which is Paul's Hebrew. Aramaic would have been his native language, and Luke translated it into Greek. That's sort of how you get into <clears throat> Paul writing in intermediate Greek, and it now when the writing is complete, Luke, who writes in advanced Greek, is translating it. And this, this is quoted by Eusebius, which, as we noted, did a lot of things to suit his own purposes. There's a shared vocabulary and syntax between the writings of Luke and Hebrews. There's about 30 of these hapax legomenoi words that are shared in common. But you've got to understand that Luke wrote the most words in the New Testament. If you look at the number of words that are in Luke and in Acts, he's wrote the most words of the New Testament. Paul may have wrote the most words books, but Luke wrote the most words. Barnabas has been suggested. And this was by Tertullian of Carthage, a church father, but if you read Acts 14, 12, it suggests that Barnabas was less eloquent than Paul. So why would we want to suggest Barnabas as a writer? Hebrews is the most eloquent book in the New Testament. Apollos um, this idea seems to originate with Martin Luther in the uh, 16th century. Uh, Apollos had the reputation for his writing to gain acceptance. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapters 1 through 4, it's stated in Acts that he was an eloquent man and he was from Alexandria. However, if you look at the church fathers, which are um, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, neither one of them... Uh, mention this possibility. Time's up. I have to stop. Thank you for your attention. I'll pick up here next week on Hebrews.